Okay, well, welcome everyone. We are thrilled to have you here as always. We are going to talk about creative cucurbits today. It's a bit of a tongue twister. And we are thrilled to be partnering with the Napa County Library. We have Stefana Premick here from the library and I'm sure she wants to say hello and welcome you all. So go ahead, Stefana. All right, thank you. Welcome everybody. Thanks for being here with us tonight. The Master Gardeners, they always provide us with such wonderful, um, useful information, all based in science, so you know that you can trust them. Um, we have a few books at the library that I think uh, really uh, work well with their program. And tonight I'm gonna feature a, a no, book no, no, called no. Mastering the Art of Vegetable Gardening. So, you know, it will tell you a, a lot, give you a lot of information about um, working your garden, what kinds of uh, vegetables will work for you, what to do with them. And uh, once you've mastered them, then guess what? We're there for you too. We have a book called Pumpkin Cheek and Chic, and it's decorating with pumpkins and gourds. So it gives you wonderful ideas about what you can do with many of the uh, items, the vegetables that you will be growing, you can use them, you know, to decorate for the aut autumnal holidays. But this one's my favorite. It's the complete book of gourd carving by Jim Whitus and Ginger Summit. And it has some beautiful, beautiful illustrations in here of gourds and what you can do with them. And um, I showed this to uh, Yvonne earlier. Here's a lovely, lovely gourd. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it's of koala bears and it's, uh, it's called linear carving. Here, and hold it up again and I'll, um, I'll make you the big, there you go. Okay. Oh, it's koalas. It's koalas, that's right. Wonderful. And it's uh, linear carving. So this book, it's, it's a gorgeous book and it will give you uh, information about what you can do with the gourds once you've harvested them. And there are many different techniques that you can use. I mean, look at this. Isn't that just gorgeous? You know, um, so it's just really exciting to take a look, uh, spend some time with the book um, and then decide whether that's something that you will use your, uh, your gourds for. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the cucumber family. I can't Say it. I practiced it in, in Latin earlier today, but I just can't get it out of my mouth. I'm tongue tied. <laughs> so um, anyway, back to you, Yvonne. All right. It is a bit of a tongue twister, I have to say. I know Jane practiced and is really good at this. Um, so um, there's somebody asking that you put the book name and author in the chat for us, Stefana. So that would be great. Thank you for that suggestion. So I'm gonna turn it over um, today to um, Jane Collier, who is our main speaker today, and she's gonna take it from here. So go ahead, Jane, and I'll spotlight you. And you need to unmute, I muted you for a moment there. So I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. Okay. Hi, I'm Jane Collier, and I joined uh, the Master Gardeners in 2011, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. So let me share the, uh, the, our mission statement with you, and it's to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscape practices to the residents of California and be guided by our core values and strategic initiatives. And we'll push the envelope a little bit on this tonight, but that's okay. And you'll be receiving uh, an email uh, with a very short survey uh, asking you know, about the program tonight. So here, here we go, creative cucurbits, and aren't those beautiful? Though I don't know if you remember the movie Caddyshack, where she peeks her head out of the shower door and asks him to loofah her stretch marks. And of course, it's not her husband, but 
but he's the he's the caddy in in Caddyshack. It was a very funny movie. Oh. So growing loofahs was more popular in a bygone era before manufactured cleaning materials. Compared to other gourds, loofahs take up a smaller space and with a couple of plants a year, you can equip your home and vanity with durable, sustainable cleaning and grooming tools that put their synthetic counterparts to shame. And this sponge can also be a gift. Many gardeners have found success selling them at farmer's markets, craft shows, and online at sites like eBay and Etsy. And about calling this a sponge, when I heard, first heard about loofahs, I thought loofah sponges, I thought they were like a, a kelp thing uh, that grew in the ocean. I had no idea uh, that they were a garden vegetable. So as a point of interest, loofah and some other gourds are edible plants. So you can harvest young plants and eat them in the same manner you would a young zucchini or summer squash. Timing is important if you plan on eating them, although, because there's a very short window of tender flesh to indestructible fiber. For this reason, many growers are interested only in the sponge. But I found out only this afternoon that loofah is used in quite a bit in Chinese cuisine. So gourds are easy to grow, and the, by far the easiest way to start them is by direct seeding. The news. Wait until after that last average frost, and for Napa, it's about April 15th. Like other vining crops, plant them in hills. Hills help to maximize airflow and minimize ambient humidity, which helps prevent the spread of disease. Because these plants are heavy feeders, a good strategy in building your hill is to dig a hole approximately one foot deep and refill it with a mixture of either aged manure or compost combined with the soil, forming it into a mound. And don't be shy about adding the compost. Be generous with it and your plants will be happy. Plants will gobble up nutrients, so feed them with an organic fertilizer every few weeks. But avoid using a high nitrogen fertilizer. As we know, nitrogen feeds leaves, not the fruit. The seed should be sown one to two inches deep in groups of several seeds each, spaced in the mounds at least five feet apart. That's the mounds are five feet apart. Seedlings should then be thinned to two or three per hill after true leaves emerge. And you can see some true leaves on those plants. Gourds need full sun at least six hours per day. They are vining plants, so give them something to grow on. I didn't put up enough fencing for them one season, and they sprawled all over the ground, like something you might read about in a Stephen King novel. Even worse, voles moved in and started eating them before they were mature. I have some finished gourds with tooth marks and gnawing evidence. And if you remind me, I'll show you. Now comes the task of preparing your loofahs for use. You will probably want to do this work outside. After the loofahs fully ripen and dry on the vine, the flesh has disappeared and only the fibrous network of xylem fibers and seeds are left. Peel the skin by knocking the loofah against a hard surface to crack the outside, then peel off the skin with your fingers or carefully cut away with a blade. I don't think you'll need to do that though. The riper the gourd, the easier it is to peel. In my experience, there seems to be a sweet spot in maturity when it's easiest to peel. I've had one that peeled just as easily as a banana. And it's okay if the fibrous material inside looks off color. You can soak the dark spots in a bath of bleach solution to make unappealing loofahs fresh and clean. Use one part bleach to 10 parts of water and soak them for a few minutes. Don't leave the loofahs in the bleach solution too long. The bleach weakens the fiber after a while. I left some loofahs actually in the bathtub with some bleach overnight. And boy, were they white on one side, but they had lost their, their loofahness, their scratchiness. 
In addition to making great a great bath time exfoliator, exfoliator, there's really nothing better. They are effect, effective at washing up around the house. Use them on grout. They are also a scratch-free option for cleaning delicate porcelain. The same loofah can be used over and over, provided you clean and dry it after each use. One harvest will last an entire year until next fall's crop comes in. Okay, now for some science, and we'll make it through this just fine, and then we'll have some fun. All right, basic in, uh, botanical specifics of the gourd family. And I'm going to mention this because some gardeners worry about cross-pollination of cucurbits. The genus includes melons, pumpkins, squash, and cucumbers. Each of those different cucurbits includes plants of different species. For example, a gardener might wonder about growing both cantaloupe and cucumbers, but is hesitant because of perceived problems with cross-pollination. Now remember, the scientific names of plants describe the two parts, the genus and the species. To illustrate, cantaloupe's scientific or botanical name is Cucumis mellow with cucumis as the genus and mellow as the species. This cucumber is cucumis sativus. So even though cantaloupes and cucumbers are in the same genus, cucumis, they are not the same species and won't be likely to cross-pollinate. Cross-pollination can only occur within plants of the same species. The old gardening tip, don't plant cucumbers next to squash or melons because they'll cross-pollinate and form bad fruit isn't true. As long as the cucurbits are different species, it's very unlikely they'll cross-pollinate. And we'll go into this. Even if they did cross-pollinate, the evidence would not be visible in this generation's crop. However, Cross-pollination can be seen in squashes and pumpkins. If the pollen from a pumpkin should happen to pollinate a delicata squash, the result will be a delicata squash. It will look and taste like a delicata squash. It does contain the genetic material from the pumpkin parent, but those genes won't express themselves in the first generation because the fruit gets its characteristics from the mother plant. In other words, if all you want is squash that tastes like squash and pumpkins that taste like pumpkins, you don't have to worry about cross-pollination. You can grow any of the cucurbits side by side with no problems. The problem comes when you want to save the seeds to plant the next year. If your delicata squash was fertilized by pumpkin pollen, seeds from that squash will grow a plant that is a hybrid of the two parents. If you are saving seeds to avoid unwanted hybrids, you must make sure that your plant was pollinated only by another member of the same variety. Because cucurbits are pollinated by bees, their pollen can travel great distances. Keep varieties at least a quarter of a mile apart. If you, <laughs> I think this is just right. I mean, who, who has a garden that big? Apart if you're saving seeds for yourself and can afford an occasional unwanted cross. If you're saving seeds to sell, keep the plants a half a mile apart or use a physical barrier, much more practical like a hoop house or a row cover. If you want to go the Frankenstein monster, in our case, the Franken squash, try planting summer squash, pumpkins, gourds, and some types of winter squash next to each other and saving the seeds. These all belong to the same plant species, Cucurba pepo. So the species is pepo. And if you get a garden catalog out and go through garden vegetables, there is page after page of pepos. So, so acorn squash, delicata squash, zucchini, and other summer squash are in are all in cucurbit to pepo. Now everything we've looked at, except the 
cucumis sativa, the, the, the uh, uh, no, that is too. It's in the cucurbitaceae family, the big family name. Cucurbits have separate male and female flowers on the same plant. You can recognize the male flowers because they do not have a small fruit behind them. They produce the pollen needed to form the fruit, but they do not produce the fruit. The female flower, on the other hand, has a small fruit behind the flower even before it opens. The female flower cannot produce the pollen needed to cause the fruit to develop and is dependent upon insect, well, in this case, insect, it's bees, to transport the pollen to the, from the male flower. The male flowers begin forming before the female flowers form. Fruit set problems can happen when female blossoms have not formed yet. If you do see female flowers on your cucurbit plants, but they are not setting fruit, then the problem may be that you don't have the pollinators for them. Or you can pollinate your cucurbit flowers yourself. Each morning, collect problem pollen from the stamens in the center of the male flowers and then transfer that pollen to the stigma in the center of the female flowers. Use a soft, small, soft bris bristled paintbrush to do this. If you're successful, you should see small fruit forming in a few days. Keep watch for the return of natural pollinators to relieve you of the mer early morning effort of pollination. And both flower types are huge and have bright orange yellow flowers. And you'll know when you find a female versus a male because there's a swollen fruit developing at the base of female flowers. In some cucurbits, that baby fruit will be more rounded and in others, more elongated. So now you may scratch be scratching your head going, well, why? What's with this male flower, female flower situation? I, you know, I, I, the flower's a flower, right? Well, that's because most flowers are called perfect flowers because they have both male and female structures on them. So on the left there, you can see the pistillate structure, which is the, the female uh, organs, and on the right are the male. And it's not just plants from different species aren't likely to cross pollinate. Pollinators are picky too. Different pollinators visit the plant because of the flower shape and the inflorescence. For example, squash bees will visit zucchini, but not watermelon. Take some time to watch and see what different pollinators are visiting the two plants. There will, there will be some overlap such as honeybees and bumblebees, but differences are also probable. Oops, sorry about that. Get ahead. So, and the fun doesn't stop with loofah gourds. Hard shell gourd varieties can also be dried and used for making a whole host of creative crafts, from musical instruments to birdhouses providing fun for the whole family. These are all gourds that came from my garden. With their skin removed, they are a handsome tan color. Look for seed for this type of gourd online. It's not very likely you'll find these kinds of gourds at a nursery. So we'll look at these uh, in the flesh in, a, in just a couple of... Uh, a couple more slides, but now let's just look at them the way they look off of the vine. So when the skin is removed from the big apple gourd, and be on the left, it could be painted red. You could fool your friends, or you could give it to a child. I'm sure the child would, would love it. And as with all gourds, you want to dry them indoors with good air circulation and use metal scouring pads to the, remove the skin on hard shell gourds. And on the left, there is a dipper gourd. On the right is a birdhouse gourd. Dipper gourds can be made into drinking vessels or ladles. Birdhouse gourds are very prolific and easy to grow. As with most gourds, it has beautiful white flowers. 
and they're edible when young and green, or you can let them dry and use for crafts as we're going to do. And these are some of my favorites. They're just so much fun. Uh, Ozark nest egg gourds strongly resemble a goose or a hen egg. They can be used to place in the nest to trick hens to lay and are perfect for making crafts. They can be found growing wild in the Ozarks, hence the name. And here are serpent gourds and swan gourds. So the long slender fur fruit of serpent gourds is tender and delicious. And you can eat them steamed, sauteed, or stuffed and baked. And you can grow them like squash, full sun, ample moisture, rich soil, and a lot of heat. These all like a lot of heat. Swan gourds need a long growing time, but in Napa County, I don't think you'll encounter any trouble. They are very interesting and make fantastic additions to fall displays. So we're going to look at decorating our gourds. And aren't these beautiful? And as uh, Stephanie was uh, commenting about the, the book that she had, which looks good to me, um, I have a book that I'm sure uh, it, it is, is featured in this slide here, but the artist is anyway. That was a little convoluted, wasn't it? Anyway. We'll, we'll look at that book when we finish here and uh, see uh, artwork just similar to these. And aren't they lovely? These, these wonderful uh, Southwestern style Indian you know, motifs. And these uh, look like they're the engraved and there are wood burning tools. There are all kinds of uh, processes you can used to make these gourds. And I can't imagine how long it took to make, well, even one of these gourds. Now this, this is approaching doable, at least for me, I think. Still, they're, they're just beautiful painted and just jolly. And look at the snake gourds, look what you can do with their Again, wouldn't a child love to have one of these? I know I would have when I was little. And here's another design that looks like it's somewhat doable. Uh, but look, they are going to use it as a birdhouse. It's got a hanger and it's got a hole. But you you can use a Dremel tool to make holes in your gourd. For instance, if you want to make bird houses, there needs to be an entrance. If you're serious about birds using your creation, there is a whole set of rules about the size and placement of the holes. And by the way, the cute awning over the hole on this gourd gives marauders a nice ledge to stand on, but little else. And it's the same with the sticks that are sometimes found, the little perches that people put underneath the holes. That's the same thing. They can, the squirrels can just stand on the stick and stick their, their heads in and, and steal the baby birds. So here we are with some recommended hole sizes, and some recommended height from the base of the gourd and the height of where you want to mount your gourd on whatever structure it is, a tree or something overhanging. So let's look at the wren here and remember that its entrance hole is one and a quarter inches and it's four inches up from the base of the gourd. And when we're finished, We'll hang it uh, six to 10 feet high. So find a, I'm going to find a branch that's six to 10 feet high from, from the ground. Now I'm going to stop my share and we'll finish these slides up after we look at the gourds. Okay. 
Now, I'm gonna make myself bigger on my own screen here so I can see, see how, I, how I can present these the best. So let's start with the loofah. So here we are. Here's a nice loofah gourd. Halfway peeled, this is the skin on it. So to peel it, we would just take our fingers and peel away. This one is, is quite old and well, still it just peels pretty easily. It just peel, peels right off. And then you're going to need to remove the skin from the, or the seeds rather from the loofahs. Here's, here's a finished one. And that will take some time because they are full of seeds. And I've made this little cardboard seed to show you how different seeds from different um, gourds. And down here, though, these are loofah seeds here. Uh, and so here you can see, you know, there are a couple of dark areas, but again, this one is pretty old and it's not getting any bigger. So I, I'm really not too worried about using this at all. Uh, you know, and it just, oh, there's really nothing better. And let's see, I wanted to show you also that these, like these copper scrubbers, these are the best thing to remove the skin, the green skin from your gourds when they are harvested. So don't wait too long. You wanna remove that skin pretty, pretty soon after you harvest the gourd. And what else do I have in here? Okay, I think we're ready to look at our birdhouse gourd. So let's think about some safety equipment. I've got this and I have these. So tonight, definitely going to use these. I'm not, the gourds aren't that heavy and I don't think they're gonna fall on my head. But when we work with a Dremel tool that I'm going to show you in a minute, the sawdust flies, it's just like wood. Splinters can fly, so protect your eyes. This is a Dremel tool. Nico, this one says Nico on it. it it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a power tool. I mean, it's, it's not a toy. This is, this is a power tool. It comes with a lot of attachments and you can sand, you can buff, you can carve, you can, you know, you can make holes bigger, which is what we're going to do, but here, let me do it here. So this is just a blatant advertisement for the Dremel Corporation, I guess. But you can see all of the variety of, of tips that, that it has that you, can, uh, that you can put on the end of your Dremel tool. So right now, let's see. Right now, I'm going to choose this tip. So this is like a, a cylinder. So it can make an even edge all the way the whole on the whole of the uh, of the birdhouse. Well, let me show you the birdhouse gourd first. Now I practiced so much <laughs> that the, the hole on this is almost done, <laughs> but I mean it, it really needs a little bit more. So we'll go ahead and we'll work on it a little bit. So here's your Dremel tool. Okay, and it just there, you just put this in here, just like, you know, common sense would tell you. And then you hold the uh, button down until it clicks. Then you have a tool that uh, tightens it. So it's not cooperating. There we go. So it clicked down. So the button has to click down, at least on this model. And I have my wrench here and I'm just going to tighten that. And it just doesn't take very much at all. And then it's uh, ready to use. Yeah. So that's on there pretty well now. 
And this is a little awkward, so I'll, I'm, you know, if you can't see it, uh, I apologize. And I'm going to try to do it right in front of you, uh, you know, with, you know, trying to face the screen and trying to do the job. So it's, it's a little awkward. So, so here we go. <laughs> So that's how you work on it and you enlarge your hole. So you can see how it's already a little bit larger. It's much more even too. And so that's that. And then you would remove your tip and change it the, the same way with the same, the same little wrench tool. So don't lose that. Okay, now I'm gonna show you some other cords. And, you know, some more uses with the Dremel. So this is a swan board. And this is the one with the tooth marks on it. So I don't know if you can see, but I can identify these little gnaw marks. And I'm sure they're from the vole. The vole ate the bottom of my Cinderella pumpkin that year. And I, boy, was I mad. Anyway. So this is a, a swan gourd, and you see it has a fissure here. And sometimes the gourds do that. And there's also a fissure, that's F-I-S-S-U-R-E. Uh, and we can use the Dremel to form these into, you know, usable shapes. So they don't look like they're mistakes for one thing. And we'll see a beautiful example of that uh, in the painting board section. There's that one. So this one too had a little hole in it and I'm going to make this hole bigger. This is a thinner one, but this is a lovely pear shaped gourd and it has some warts on it. I do like the warts. So I can enlarge this and then it can be a nice little you know, and maybe another hole on the other side and then paint it up and it'll be a nice, uh, it'll be a nice decoration. Okay. Remember our apple gourd? Well, here it is. It's such a beautiful color. You know, I have decorated some of the eggs you know, for Christmas decorations, they're just perfect for, you know, hanging on boughs. But these are actually so beautiful. I, you know, I haven't had the nerve. I, you know, I, I feel like I, I'm just going to ruin it if I, if I get my paintbrush out. But, you know, I, I am going to try to forge ahead and actually paint some of these. I don't know about this one, though. It is so pretty just by itself. And I'll, let me show you a couple more that are beautiful just by themselves. This one, I mean, look at the lovely natural tones that this came out with, you know, with the skin removed. I just, I, I think that's gorgeous. Now you can, uh, you know, uh, shoe polish even is used or, you know, a, a clear finish of some kind, or, you know, a light, a light stain might be uh, good on this board if you don't want to, uh, you know, cover up the, the lovely markings it came with. And here's just a cute gourd. I mean, what a delightful shape this is. I mean, you could just paint this up and put it on your shelf and it, what a nice accent. Now here's the bull gourd. This one has a lot of warts on it. And this is pretty much an apple gourd with a skin problem. So, I mean, it's just lovely, sturdy, hard 
warts are just, I, I just love it. Let's see, where are we? Here's a dipper gourd. And you would just cut off the top of that and then it would make a nice, um, a nice dipper. So you can shake it and right now it's a nice wrap. And here, here are the nest eggs I was talking about. So you can see that I put, I put hangers on them, but these are just so much fun. I, I love them. And it's so much fun when they grow. They grow along the ground and it's like finding Easter eggs. They're white when they, uh, you know, as they grow. And it, it, it's fun to count them. You can see if, see how many more there are the next day. Okay, and now, oh, let me show you this. Let me show you this. You can see how thick the, the, the skin is on this gourd. The whole top has been removed on this, but if I hold up the, uh, the ruler, it's a full quarter of an inch. So these are like wood. So treat them as you would wood. And that's why, I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say wear the, wear the glasses. Now we have some nice big ones to show you. This is a bushel basket gourd, and you can see why. So I thought for this one, since my dog is always tipping over the wastebasket, I would make this into a wastebasket with a lid. So try to fool her so she, she'll probably learn how to take the, the top of this off. But I thought it would make a nice little wastebasket for the floor. Wow. And here, hold on, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Hold on. You can imagine what this room might look like. So here is a snake gourd. So it's, it's pretty big. I mean, it's, it's upward of five feet long or maybe even a little, a little bigger than that. So it's a, it's a big boy. Okay. Well, now let's look at some painted cords. First, I want to show you this book. And remember who uh, the his name is Robert Rivera, the artist who I was talking about. I. Uh, that looks familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure that uh, the slide that we had, that we saw, uh, the gourds were by Robert Rivera. So I'm going to show you the painted gourds now. And uh, my sister, my late sister, was an inspired artist, and she loved to paint gourds. And following, you know, the design in this book, I don't know how you if you can see this too well, these uh, are called Anasazi dancing gourds. Indian motif, Southwestern Indian motif, of course. So she made some. And I, they're just highly successful, I think. Uh, they always come in threes. So this is the third one. So they all stand at different attitudes with their upside down heads. And they have fine details on them like, you know, uh, cowrie shells. I mean, the actual shells they use for wampum or, you know, their money. And uh, 
some fabric that looks like uh, snake skin. Uh, they're just really, they're nicely appointed. So, you know, I mean, have some, take some time with your gourds and find some, find some nice things to adorn them with. And here's another painted gourd. And this one is a little, he's a poison dart frog. So you might be able to see his little red mouth here. And then as we turn the gourd, his whole body goes around the gourd. Here are his little feet, another little foot. So yes, so he's a he's a painted, you know, you've you've seen little keychains or whatever with poison dart frogs. Now this one. Now this one, you can see, you know, she made quite a few holes in this one. I, I don't know, uh, maybe, you know, what condition it was in in the first place. It's nice and sturdy. It's got the nice quarter of an inch thick uh, skin, but you can see the, the form of the flowers follows the, the contour of the hole. So, you know, it's used to, to her advantage that way. And it's, this is just a beautiful. And notice how the, the top has been painted to the stem. So don't cut your stems off. I mean, they're, they're beautiful when they're done. And here is the last painted gourd I'm going to show you. And it's a, 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 like Australian uh, Aboriginal motif with, uh, I'll hold it closer here. Uh, you know, there's a base color on it. It's not the natural color base. And then, um, you know, painted with the, the color and with a million dots painted in. So I'm going to tell you how to make the dots. You want to take your paintbrush and not using the brush part, but the base, you know, the point of your brush, you will stick that into the paint thing and then press it on and you get a perfect little circle every time. So at this point, I need to go back and share my screen again and finish the slides up. And then after everything's done, we'll take some questions. Let's see. I'm gonna put my glasses back on now so I can see something. Here they are. Okay. Okay. So this slideshow will be available on our website. So I've uh, put some nice references at the end. Uh, at the end of these slides, uh, so you can check those out. And meanwhile, this is our website. This just, I mean, I can't even begin to tell you how much information there is there. And this is how to find the website. When you go to the, uh, this is the front page. This is the, what do you call it? The main page. And a little further down the page, it will say references and slides, workshops and events. And that's where you will find a recording of this show. Now, do I have any questions? Do we want to take the poll first? Oh, yes. Okay, let's do let's, poll. Let's do our poll. So we have three questions for you tonight. The first one, did you learn something new at tonight's program? Second one is, will you try growing loofahs or other gourds in your garden? And the third one, 
is will you try your hand at some of these wonderful crafts or ideas for using gourds that we've given you today? So just take a moment to answer the questions. We'll leave it up for just a couple of seconds and then we'll publish the results. So we know what everybody's doing or thinking. There's been some great questions in the chat and we'll get to those in just a moment right after this poll is done. Just a couple more people haven't um, entered their answers yet. Wonderful. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and show you what people said. So it looks like everyone's inspired, the complete group is inspired to try growing gourds and to try doing um, some of the crafts, woohoo. <laughs> these are easy, like Jane said, some of these are so beautiful, you can just use them as is once you take that skin off, but it's certainly fun to try painting them too. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll go to the questions. So let's see, um, there was a question about um, how do you remove the seeds from the loofah gourd? Oh, first you get a chair and you sit in your chair <laughs> because you'll be there for a while and you're going to shake them and they'll come out that way and you'll get a, a poker or a skewer of some kind and you'll force them out that way and just you know, a few at a time, they'll come out. By far, that's, it will take you more time to remove the seeds than it will to take the skin off. And then um, somebody's asking, what sort of trellis do you recommend? If you trellis them, what do you think would be good? I have seen, the ones that are the best, of course, are the overhead trellises. Uh, they can climb up and then they can hang down. Uh, if that isn't available, anything uh, will do. I put up just the delineating stakes with some, well, not chicken wire, but, you know, hog wire, and they can climb up that. And, you know, it's not unsightly after the, the uh, gourds grow up because they're full of leaves and, you know, it looks pretty nice. And then you can see your gourds growing and hanging down from it. So almost anything. They, they love to grow on, they love to grow up, but they'll grow out too. Yeah, I've seen some really, especially for those snake gourds, it's nice to have them trellised because they will um, get more twisty if you don't let them hang straight, right? Yeah. Um, somebody's asking, how about using a tomato cage for the loofah? And I think that would be fine. Loops kind of small. <laughs> gourds are more, uh, they're more well behaved than other types of gourds. Uh, at least mine were. And they were more of a bush variety and they didn't sprawl as much. So I think you'll probably be just fine with a big tomato cage, not one of these stinky little things, but you know, a big one. And then be ready to, to brace that too. If you I, need to. I've seen loofahs growing along like a three foot high fence that looked kind of nice because it was it was covering the fence and it was, you know, made a nice divider for the garden area. Right. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I, they love to grow. I, they would grow up anything. I don't see any other questions right now. Right. Anybody else have questions they want to type in the chat or? Okay, it looks like we might um, be done. Thank you everybody right. for coming.